Income tax, 2022-2023, residential rental property, rental income and expenses if no personal use of dwelling, tax software example. Let's do some wealth preservation with some tax preparation. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course, each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. Here we are in our example form 1040 populated with Lacert tax software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but it's a great tool to run scenarios with. You can also get access to the form 1040 related forms and schedules at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. So our starting point will be, we've got the single filer, Mr. Anderson living in 90210 Beverly Hills. And we're going to start off with the W-2 income and then compare the same amount of income, 100000 from a W-2 to a Schedule C to a Schedule E. So our starting point, W-2 income, 100000 We've got the 12950 That's the standard deduction. That gets to the taxable income, 87050 Page number two, then calculating the tax at 14774 because this is W-2 income, we don't have any self-employment tax or any of that. So the tax remains at the 14774. Now I'm just going to kind of jot that down over here on our little Excel worksheet. So we our first starting scenario. Let's make this a little bigger. Let's get rid of this row. Why is that there? That doesn't need to be there. Let's say this was 100,000 and the AGI was 100 thousand the taxable income was 8750 87050 the federal tax then page number two 14774 14774 self-employment tax zero total tax 14774 let's compare that then to a schedule c income and then we'll go to a schedule e uh, income so it gets a lot more complicated when I get to a Schedule C, although the idea of what's deductible when you get to a Schedule C and a Schedule E makes more sense because when we just have the W-2 income, oftentimes the things that might be deductible, for example, if we go to a Schedule A, are things that, that aren't like natural to an, in, an income tax system. You would expect the things that would be natural to an income tax system would be to be able to deduct those expenses needed in order to generate the income so that you tax people on net income, not on the gross income. So, but uh, with W-2 income, it's the idea would be that the employer took care of all those business related items. So the income doesn't have anything that you needed to expend in order to generate the income. And therefore the things that we think about are, as deductions are kind of unnatural, like medical expenses, taxes, interest on your personal residence uh, and that kind you know charitable gifts these are things that are, that have other reasons other than being a natural thing for income taxes to be able to deduct when we get to the schedule c and the schedule e we have a standard income statement which at least from that point just the income statement makes perfect sense you would think from an income tax type of system because we have income and then the expenses that we needed to expand in order to generate the income those are the deductible amounts uh for for those items all right let's go back on over and i'm going to say let's get rid of the w-2 income that's no more and let's add a schedule c okay this adds a lot of a mess to it i did just a generic schedule c and so if I go to the Schedule C, this is the profit or loss from a business. And then we'll go to a Schedule E. You'll note I put a little income statement. So we have 120000 of income. We have the 20000 of expenses. So we get to that 100000 which is mirroring a similar kind of thing with the W-2 income, where we had the 100000 straight from the W-2 income. Now that 100000 is going to flow into Schedule 1 
So there's the 100,000 here. It's gonna flow into the form 1040, not on line 1A, but rather on uh, line eight here. So then we got the 100,000, but then we got some other stuff happening. One of which being on page two, we're not just calculating the federal income tax, but now we have the self-employment tax. So this becomes a big deal because that could be quite significant, the self-employment tax. So if I then go on over and say, okay, how was that calculated? Well, we had the Schedule C and the net income on the Schedule C flowed into the Schedule SE, self-employment tax. We calculated then the 14,129, which flowed into page uh, two. There's the 14,129, which is flowing into the form 1040, page two. And there's the 14,129, that's quite significant. And then we get half of that is actually deductible. So now we also have on page one, this item that got populated in the adjustments to income. How was that? How did that happen? Well, we've got the schedule C where we've got the uh, 100,000 that is flowing into the schedule SE. And that's going to be the 14,129 self-employment tax, which is similar to uh, to like payroll taxes if we were in, but we would it would be like the employee employer portion of payroll taxes then we've got half of it 7065 that's what's flowing into schedule one page number two there's that that's what's flowing into the form 1040 so now we've got the 100,000 income the 7065 so we have an adjusted gross income that is now 92 935 we've got the same standard deduction 12,950 but then we also have this qualified business income deduction which you know that came came into play a few years ago and obviously is quite significant here so that muddies up the water and this, so we've got the 15994 huge item there and then that gets our taxable income to the 63988 page number two then the taxable income is a lot lower than it was with the with the w-2 income so the federal income tax is much lower 9692 but we've got this giant self-employment tax which is more than what you would pay on on a w-2 employee situation because you would only pay the employee portion not the employer portion so it's kind of like doubled you know what you would you would be doing if you were made the hundred thousand as a uh employee not quite double but in close and so that gives us a tax of 23 8 21 so let's check that out so i'm gonna let's jot that down jot it down jot it down so we're gonna say we had a hundred thousand this time of schedule c income but the agi is only 92 935 so 92 935 did i get that right did i get that right all right, I get it. You know, people. Yes, thank you. And twelve thousand. So that means the six three nine eight eight six three nine eight eight is here. Federal income tax on page number two is only nine six nine two nine six nine two. Self employment tax though now is in play fourteen one twenty nine one four one two nine and then. The total tax is now 23,821. 23,821. So the bottom line is the Schedule C is working out worse for us, even though the federal income tax is less because we've got this massive, we've got this massive self-employment tax, which you might say, well, hey, the W-2 income paid the self-employment tax as well in the withholdings. And they did. They paid half of the self-employment tax, though, whereas this is twice the you know we had to pay more self-employment tax here like double the self-employment so it gets quite kind of messy and confusing as to which which one of those is going to play out best but one of the factors that are coming into play here of course is you know the self-employment tax is a big issue now when we get to the schedule e because the schedule e oftentimes is more of a passive income then we we might move from reporting it on the Schedule C, and the Schedule C is usually the form that you're going to use in an active type of business because that's going to generate and calculate the self-employment tax. If we have uh, a rental property that's more of a passive property, then the idea, hopefully, it's not subject to the self-employment tax would be nice. So let's now 
let's now get rid of the schedule C and say, let's remove the schedule C. Let's just delete it. And then now let's do a similar kind of thing on, a, on just a kind of a standard schedule E. And we can get more into like the details of the schedule E, but I'll just do a similar kind of general scenario on the schedule E. I have now replaced the Schedule C with a Schedule E, Supplemental Income and Laws from Rental Real Estate Royalties Partnership and so on and so forth. We might go into more detail up top here, but for now, note that down here we have a normal kind of income statement format similar to what we saw on the Schedule C. Income minus expenses, those ordinary and necessary expenses we needed to generate the income, gets down to the net income of the 100000 again. That's going to pull into the Schedule 1. So it's pulling into the Schedule 1, which is pulling into the Form 1040. The Form 1040 here, there's the 100000 However, there's a lot less action going on. This looks a lot more similar to what we saw with the W-2 type of income because then we have the, we just have the 12000 950 uh, of the standard deduction gets us to the 87,050 page number two calculating the tax at the 14,774 and we don't have that self-employment tax uh, all that kind of scenario that was taking place so this is basically mirroring similar to what we had with the w2 kind of situation although it's pulling in from a schedule c this was 100 thousand 100 thousand so the agi 100 thousand and this is 87050 and the federal income tax on page number two then it's 14774 14774 no self-employment tax generally so that's the general idea and then we're going to say 14774 so you can see that the schedule c is it could actually be a lot more a lot more confusing it's actually a lot more confusing for me or have a lot more impacts because it's often going to be subject to that self-employment tax although the schedule e uh, can get kind of confusing especially when you get into the range of losses and you typically have to deal with other things that are confusing on a schedule e including things like depreciation of of the property as well as when people get into more complex schedule c e areas where you don't have just a pure rental property but they have like their home and they're renting part of it or something like that where it's a co-mingling of business and uh uh and personal or if they have a vacation home and they're renting it so those kind of things become confusing factors with the rental property let's now focus on schedule e in more detail we have part number one income or loss from rental real estate and royalties note if you are in the business of renting personal property, use Schedule C because in that case, it would be business income Schedule C then being subject to the self-employment tax. C instructions. If you are an individual, report form rental income or loss from Form 4835 on page 2, line 40. Then we have the question of did you make any payments in 2022 that would require you to file form 1099 in other words did you have contractors and stuff that you paid and you have to issue them the 1099s if yes did you or will you file the required forms so we're going to assume yes you filed the 1099 forms as uh, required for the contractor work physical address of each property so we've got the address of the property type of the property so here's the number reference the types of property down below single family residence multi-family residence vacation short-term rental commercial land royalties self-rental and other so for each rental real estate property listed above report the number of fair rental and personal use days uh, check the QJV box only if you meet the requirements to file a qualified joint venture. So we're going to assume here the 365 days, things get a little bit more messy when there's personal use days, often the case when you have like a vacation home uh, kind of scenario in place. And then of course, down below, we've got the standard income statement, a little bit different than the look of the Schedule C because it's possible to have multiple properties on the on this one form right so we've got a b and c on the properties obviously the rents received uh would be like the normal income line instead of just general income on the schedule c because it's a rental property so that would be pretty much uniform you would expect if you had rental properties and then the expenses 
that you had to consume in order to generate those similar concepts with the Schedule C ordinary and necessary uh, expenses, advertising, auto travel, cleaning, commission, insurance, legal management fees, uh, repairs, supplies, taxes, utilities, depreciation, other, the general format of types of expenses. And then in essence, we're going to be adding these up and getting down to uh, the net income. Although it gets a little bit messy down here because when we get into a loss scenario in particular, we could be limited uh, due to passive passive activity rules, which we'll talk more about in future presentations. But the general idea is that you've got to be, the IRS is skeptical on the rental property because of losses. Now, the other big expense here is depreciation, which we'll, we'll dive into it in, in, a, in a future presentation and focus on uh, the depreciation because the cost of the property itself is going to be a huge cost and we have to allocate that cost over a fairly long time frame uh, based on what the tax code is requiring us to do. We also have the other big one, of course, is the mortgage interest, which you're most likely familiar with as something that could be deductible on the Schedule A if the mortgage interest was for your personal residence. But now we're talking about a rental property, which you got a similar kind of loan from the bank for uh, that has the property as collateral, but now it's not personal property. It's not your personal residence. You, you needed that for to purchase the home. And so now you're paying the expense on the purchasing power the rent on the purchasing power which is going to be the interest so that's going to be another kind of big uh, factor here now when we get into these losses i just want to kind of point out that the difference here because if you look at a schedule c kind of income if i was doing some kind of business and i was just earning money on a schedule c i did some gig work or whatever and i'm doing on in the platforms paying me youtube is paying me or whatever is happening then then the, the, then I would have income minus my expenses here. And that would be the main, the main thing I would be doing my job for. But the Schedule E can be a little bit different because if I buy this property, there's a couple things I'm looking for from this property. One is of course to generate revenue. So I'm going to, I'm going to want to generate revenue by renting out the property. If I bought it as a rental property, and, and I'm going to have to have revenue for a significant amount of time in order to recoup, of course, the cost of the property. But the other factor is that, it's, that this is not like a piece of equipment that I bought for my Schedule C business because most stuff that's depreciable property will deteriorate in value. If I bought a forklift, if I bought a machine that I needed to use in my business, it's going to depreciate down in value. So although the property itself will depreciate. It'll have wear and tear to it and will record depreciation. It's quite possible. And what I'm probably hoping for is just due to the location, if if nothing else, the, the value of the property actually increases. And that's what's kind of different about real estate because we're, we have an investment in the value of the property, which is probably a significant part of the purchase of the real estate in addition to just the income that you're getting down here. So what the IRS is, is going to be skeptical of is people buying property in order to, of course, just kind of sit on it and hope that it appreciates, you know, in value while renting it out a little bit possibly, but running losses, even if you run significant losses on the rentals here, because you can then take the losses against your other income. So in that case, you would, you'd you be running losses. You'd get a benefit from the losses that you can take against other income. And your primary hope is that the, that the property actually increases in value just due to the location of the property or something like that. So you can see the dynamic is a little bit, a little bit different than like a service business on a schedule C because you don't have that factor of you thinking that you're, that the value of your YouTube channel or whatever is going to explode or something. It's really, you just working to generate revenue in the short term is the general idea. So that kind of muddies up the picture in terms of, okay, uh, what, what happens with the passive activity rule? So the IRS is even a little bit more skeptical than on a Schedule C business when you get into the losses uh, and, and questioning as to whether you should be able to take those losses 
against like other income. And so that that gets into these, you know, passive activity rules we'll talk about more. If you have income, then it's not really an issue. If you have rental income, then obviously the IRS wants their share. If you have losses, the IRS is going to be skeptical. Now, many of these other expenses are going to be pretty much similar to what you saw with the Schedule C. So you've got to think about your accounting method. Oftentimes, the method is going to be a cash based method for a lot of people that are doing the rental property because it's kind of easier and we don't have a lot of the things that force us to go to the accrual method such as tracking inventory uh, that's what usually pushes people for, on a schedule c business from being able to use a cash-based method to having to use an accrual method because the inventory kind of pushes people over when we get to things like auto expenses uh, for example then you, you've got a similar kind of question there and how you're going to do that. Is it going to be the mileage method or are you going to do the direct write-off method? There's, you know, you have to travel uh, that, that similar rules with a, with a Schedule C type of business with those types of items. The big difference is being the, the mortgage interest is clearly going to be almost always a component of the rental property and the depreciation is going to be a clear component of the rental property. Now, the other big thing that comes up with rental property that might be a little bit different than what comes up with a Schedule C oftentimes is that you're going to end up with repairs, right? So the rental property needs to be repaired. And then the, the, always the question comes up then, well, if I have a big number in this repair item, is it something that is a repair or is it something that is actually I need to capitalize as a depreciable item? And you can see the difference here. If I had if I spent $15,000 on the roof, then the question is, do I get that $15,000 as an expense, which I would like to do, because if I can expense it at $15,000, then I would reduce my income in this period and I'd get the, the benefit now. Or do I have to put it on there as like an improvement, in which case I would have to amortize or depreciate the improvement over a long period of time i wouldn't get the i would still get the benefit but it would take a lot longer i would like to get the benefit sooner due to the time value of money so you get this always this question of i and and the the idea from our perspective i would like to format things in such a way that i don't have to capitalize them if i can and rather take the expense at the point in time i put them on the books so i can maximize the expense here and if I have to put it on the books as a as an asset and and then depreciate is there any way I can I can break it down so I have a lesser time frame to depreciate over in other words if I have to put it on the books as an asset and I fixed the roof is it possible that I could basically say well instead of making it you know 15 year property or 30 year improvement or something like that could I say, well, part of it was for air conditioning or something, and the air conditioning should be equipment, which is depreciated over seven years instead of, you know, you know th those kind of questions often uh, can come up. And when you're when you're working on the rental property and you're allocating the expenses, whenever you look at this repairs and maintenance kind of category, you often want to scan that and say, okay, are there any huge items in here that look like they are may not be repairs, but rather be uh, some kind of improvements. And when we're thinking about making big repairs and improvements, we want to think about the depreciation schedules. Do I have, can, how am I going to put this on the books with regards to depreciation? Cause that can have a significant tax impact.